It, uh, it's been a challenge. Queenstown's one of those towns where everybody seems to be coming through for a short time. And so we've had uh, quite a few number of people come and stay for a month or two or three and then keep moving. And then COVID happens. So anyway, Lord knows, uh, Pastor Rudd is filling in for me down there tonight and uh, they rang me trying to find the key a few minutes ago. So praise the Lord, it looks like they're having a service tonight, so that's encouraging. Let's take our Bibles and go to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. Blessed to be with you folks tonight, and uh, it's always an encouragement to see what God's doing here up in Berwyn. Uh, so many of the churches here in New Zealand don't have their own building. If you guys have your own place, it's just a real, real encouragement to those of us who are still meeting in school halls and St. John Ambulance rooms and everywhere else. So uh, don't take for granted what you have. Just the singing is a blessing. You say, our singing is a blessing? Yes, your singing is a blessing. When you have three or four people on a Sunday night and I'm doing all the singing, it, uh, this is a blessing. So praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, let's look down at verse 19. This is what we're going to kick off here tonight. Philippians 4, 19 is a well-known promise that I'm sure most of us have seen before. The Bible says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Of course, God has unlimited resources. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. And uh, Jesus Christ, of course, is God Almighty, first and last, infinite God. And he has the ability to supply, well, he has the ability to supply all our wants, but the promise is he supply all our need. And my question for you tonight is, what do you need most today? What is it that you need most? Now you can say, Pastor Williams, what I need tonight most is, what would you fill in the blank? You know, for some of you, it might be money. You've got bills, you've got debts, you've got a mortgage, you've got something you can't afford. And if you had some money tonight, that is your biggest need, and it would certainly solve a lot of problems if you had it. For some of you tonight, it might be wisdom. You're struggling with some decision you need to make. Maybe about your career, maybe about your uh, future spouse, uh, maybe about some family matter, some uh, thing where you just need some wisdom with your kids. If you had that wisdom, it would solve everything tonight. Maybe tonight you need some encouragement. You came here tonight, you were just discouraged, depressed, frustrated, irritated, and you just need, you know, someone to give you some encouraging words. I don't know what you need, is what you need tonight. Maybe some of you need a, a rebuke. You've been acting like a spoiled brat lately and just kind of doing your own thing. You just need somebody to pull you up short. Maybe it's forgiveness. You've had a bitter streak lately, and it's just been eating you alive, or some guilt or something like that. Maybe for somebody it's relief. You've got sickness, you've got pain, you've got pressure, you can't catch your breath, you just need a little bit of relief. Maybe it's love. You can just use a hug tonight. You can just use somebody to uh, be genuine with you, and you know, whether it's the kids or the, re the spouse, some other relationship with the Lord. I don't know what it is. But I want you tonight just to get something in your mind. What is it that I do need most tonight? The promise is that God would supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I want you to get something in there. There's probably something in your heart that will pop up. And we want to look at that tonight and say, okay, if that is really what I need most, how does that promise take care of that need? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Let's go ahead, Lord, in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to live in a free country, Lord, where we can open your word without fear tonight, and we can ask for your help and know that you've given us the promise that you'll interpret this book and apply it to our hearts, Lord, and, and just use it to literally meet our needs. And God, I pray tonight that whatever the needs are in this congregation, that you would just help people to look at them in a new light tonight, that they'd look at them from your perspective that they look at them through the lens of your word. And Father, that we would get some very tangible, real help from your word tonight as to how to take care of these needs in our lives. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. So you got some need in your life. The obvious question is, how are you going to get this need met? What do you have to do to take care of the need? Normally, we look at a need like, I need more money, and we think, oh, I need another job. 
or I need uh, forgiveness, maybe I need to go talk to somebody about this problem. But the reality tonight is that most of us look at these needs and they're so big that we just kind of despair. How am I ever going to solve this problem? We pray about it and sometimes we don't seem to get a lot of results right away and it just discourages us. And there's a lot of needy people I've seen and in, in just talking with people. And the people can very easily go on in their misery just throwing their hands up and saying there's no way to ever solve this problem. Well, today I want to try to look at how we get what we need most. And I'm going to show you a few things in Scripture that are absolutely necessary if we're going to meet our needs, get Jesus to meet our needs. And the first verse I want to share with you is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, 23. The verse says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And then in parenthesis, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Why don't you come to church tonight? You know, for some people it's just tradition. It's just, well, it's what we do. It's Sunday night, and I, I always go to church, you know? Uh, for some folks, it's to kind of get God off their back. You know, I don't want God being upset with me, and so I need to be faithful. Some of us had good motives. Some of us have kind of, you know, the rut motives. We're just going through the motions. But as you look around the world, church attendance is clearly an issue these days, isn't it? Because we have an afternoon service and no morning service, I'll often go downtown Queenstown on Sunday morning and pass out tracks. I know I'm getting to people who aren't in church. It's pretty easy. They're there on the street. <laughs> And most people could absolutely care less about God or about church. It's the spirit of our age. And it's even an issue sometimes in independent Baptist circles. I think COVID has taught a lot of people that they can stay home and watch a service on TV, and they don't actually have to be physically in a church building. Clearly, I'm preaching to the choir because you're here tonight. But why are you here? What did you hope to get by coming tonight? What's the real reason people do skip churches? They've got all kinds of excuses, and uh, this particular passage here is one that preachers often use to kind of, you know, beat people over the head about the need to be faithful to the local church. But the reality tonight is that you have a God that loves you, and he has told you to be here for a reason, because there is a 100% chance that whatever it is that you need most tonight, part of the answer is going to be found by being here tonight. Your faithfulness in coming here is a necessary step in God supplying our needs. I want you to look at this passage again with me, and I want us to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. So often we focus on the first few words of verse 25 that we kind of miss where the passage is actually going. 23, 24, and 25 are all one sentence. You notice 23 and 24 don't end in a full stop, but 25 does. And there's something in this passage that shows us that sometimes we approach attending church from the wrong perspective. When you come here tonight, God wants to help you meet that greatest need. It may be something in the preaching. It may have been something in the singing and you missed it. It may be something from another believer. But somehow, some way, God is working in each of our lives to draw us closer to him and to meet our needs. And when you look at this passage, the foundational truth to the whole thing is what's in the parenthesis. That's like the thing that Paul ran back to to support everything he was saying. And the promise in the parenthesis at the end of verse 23 is he is faithful that promised. Can God tell a lie? No, he can't tell a lie. Can he break a promise? No, he can't break a promise. When God says something, it always is true. When he said that he would meet your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that's a promise. He can't break that. And as you look at this passage, he says in verse 23 that our faith is under attack. He says we need to hold fast the profession of our faith. Since the day you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the devil lost you. You were going to spend eternity with him, and you slipped through his grasp. And his total plan for your life now 
is to tie you up in knots, to make you ineffective in serving Jesus Christ, to distract you, to tear you away, to get your attention somewhere else so that you're not serving the Lord. And the Lord's reminding us we need to hold fast. We need to hang on to that profession that we've made of our faith in Christ. And then in verse 24, you got an and, and he says, and let us consider one another. Now, this is going to be in the context of assembling of ourselves together in verse 25. So you've done that. You've come through the door tonight. You've come in here. You are assembling together with the other believers. So let me ask you tonight, have you obeyed that first part of verse 24? Have you looked around this room and considered anybody else here? Hmm, I wonder what their need might be. I wonder what they're going through. You know, they asked me to pray about something last Wednesday night or two Wednesday nights ago. I pray for that. Have we spoken to them? Have we encouraged them in some way? In coming together, there are some commands in this passage that remind us that walking into this room is not all about what can I get from God tonight. That's part of the equation, but only part of the equation. We do worship God. We give something to Him back. That's important as well. But another vital reason why we come together is to be a blessing to each other. It says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So if verse 24 means anything, when I walk into a church service and I'm spending time with other believers, I'm looking around trying to figure out what do other people need? How can I help them? How can I help them love God more? How can I provoke them to love and to do something for the Lord? And then verse 25, the part we all know about, says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And there are many who do this, as the manner of some is. And then there's a third one here. Not only do I consider, not only do I provoke others, but I'm to exhort one another. What do I do when I exhort? Well, it's partly what the preacher is doing right now. I'm teaching, I'm preaching, I'm challenging you, I'm trying to encourage you to take action. And that's what exhorting is. But it's not just the job of the guy behind the pulpit. It's the job of everyone. Who have you considered? Who have you provoked to love and to good works? Who have you exhorted? Many of us get away with walking in here, smiling at a few people, shaking a few hands, and then walking back out, and we don't interact with anybody in the way that these verses are saying. But if we're going to see God meet our needs and the other needs of the other believers, these are vital steps of what happens in a local church. Uh, go with me over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Clearly, if you don't gather together, these commands are impossible to keep. I've talked to a heap of guys here lately who uh, had to go down the road of putting their services on Zoom or Facebook or something like that. And they've said that since all that has started to die down, some people have come to, back to church and others have stayed home saying, well, you know, we're still participating in the church. We're still watching, watching on the, the internet. But you can't do these things if you're not here. You can't read other people's body language. You can't speak with them and consider them and provoke them unless you're talking to them face to face. And uh, that's why it's so important that we get together. So I want to give you just that little bit of new perspective here. Your faithful God has something for you here today. And it may be the word of another faithful believer, or maybe you being that faithful believer speaking to somebody else. Look over at 1 Samuel chapter 7. Now, if you're going to find what you need in a local church service, there are two things that make this a whole lot easier. Two vital steps. And the first one we're going to find here in 1 Samuel chapter 7, look down at verse 3. And the context here is that the Jews had a new king, it would have been King Saul, and uh, Samuel's challenging them about how to deal with their new king. And he says in 1 Samuel 7, verse 3, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, 
Then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. And then what's he tell them there in that next phrase? And what? You can talk to me, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> and prepare. That's what it says. And prepare your what? Yes. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. One of the greatest needs that the nation of Israel had at this point in history was relief. They were being oppressed by the Philistines. It was just stifling everything. Their families, their jobs, their worship of God. They needed leadership, and God provided them with a king. And Samuel said, it's not going to work unless you prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Again, many times we come into a service... And we haven't spent five seconds thinking about preparing our hearts for whatever that service may encounter or include. But that's something that we need. If you're going to get what you need when you come to this church service, and you're going to be a blessing in helping others with their need, you need to stop before you come in here and say, Lord, it's church time again. Help me to come in here with an open heart tonight. Help me to be ready to receive whatever, whatever comes across. If somebody says something to me, Help me to be ready for that. Help me to have the right response. Help me to be a blessing. And just spending a few minutes talking to God and preparing to put these things into effect. I realize we get busy, got the kids, got everybody together, jump in the car, rush, we jump in, and, and we don't do that. We miss out on the blessing. Preparation. Look over at Psalm 42. Psalm 42. It's something we're all guilty of. I mean, let's face it. We're, we're running the rat race. We're going through all the things that we need to do. And this simple act of preparation that can make such a difference is something that's very easy to overlook. And if you're going to be honest, you probably overlooked it tonight, many of you. But we need to be preparing our hearts. Psalm 42, look at verse 1. As the heart, that would be a deer, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. So David's talking about going up to the house of God with the other worshipers of God. But he says before he did that, he stopped and thought about what the big picture was. He desired God. He prepared himself to come into the presence of the Lord in the house of God. We need to prepare our hearts. It's so the second thing we need to do. Look at Psalm 62. Psalm 62. Maybe there's been some burden on your heart all week. Maybe some need that you haven't really put into words or quantified, but now that we're talking about it, you get an idea what it is. <coughs> the challenge would have been to come here tonight and be prepared and say, Lord, I've, I've got this problem. Give me something tonight in church. I need, I need some encouragement. I need some help here, you know. Give me some direction. And so we prepare our hearts. Then the second thing we need to do is listen, expecting something to happen. Listen expectantly. Look at Psalm 62, verse 5. 62, 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. What did you expect from church tonight? What were you hoping that would happen? I don't know. We weren't expecting anything. And that's the problem. If we don't expect anything... We walk out, we're not disappointed because nothing happened. We should come in here expecting God to say something to us. Expecting God to address some issue in our lives. And we listen to the preaching, we look at the music that we're singing, we listen to what the believers are saying, we listen to the scripture reading, looking for something, hunting for something. God, what do you have to say to me? God's not going to speak in a vision tonight. He's not going to have somebody pop up and speak in tongues. He's going to speak through this book and this book working through other people. 
And when we expect nothing, often we're not disappointed. But we should be. We should be expecting God, something, God to do something. When we read our Bibles in the morning, the same thing. We should read our scripture reading expecting God to give us a nugget, to speak to us, to show us something. <clears throat> Even some of the most useless, dull, boring preachers I have ever heard. A church where I've gone in and it's been an absolute waste of a message where the guy said absolutely nothing, God has had something to say to me. And when I have been prepared, and I have gone in expectantly, God will use whatever is there to speak to our hearts, if we'll trust him for it. I have read some passages of scripture, and knowing that it's going to be a tough passage, I mean, Exodus, or First Chronicles, or Le Leviticus, or something, and God has just shown me some nugget, some gem, when I've been prepared and read it, looking and expecting for something to happen. We just need to be prepared. Uh, go with me over to James chapter 4. So I don't know what your greatest need is tonight, but I want to challenge you from tonight and going forward to make sure you're faithful here in church. Your faithful Lord is going to be faithful to his promises, but he needs you to come together. And when you do, he's got something for you. Prepare your heart. Listen expectantly. And then do your job to be a blessing to other people. Consider each other. Provoke where you can. Encourage to good works and to love. But there's a second thing that's necessary if we're going to see these needs in our lives met. In James chapter 4, look down at verse 1 with me. James 4 verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Why? Because you ask not. You don't have for the simple reason that you didn't ask. Now I realize there's other considerations here, but the Bible principle is that we take our needs to God. And we pray until we get an answer. It's easy for us to pray about something once and throw it out there, and then we just kind of leave it there and carry on, oh, well, God hasn't answered yet, and we don't pray through the thing. James gives us an example back in chapter 1, verse 5. James 1, 5. If your greatest need tonight was wisdom, well, here's the illustration. Verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They giveth to all men liberally or generously, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God's not going to chew you out. He loves you. He's not going to upbraid you or rebuke you for asking for something. He's a heavenly father who wants to bless, and he simply wants us to ask. You realize that God doesn't have to wait for you to ask? He can just give you everything you need without you asking. But he wants you to depend on him. And he's laid out a path in his word where he wants us to ask and to show that we're dependent upon him in many cases before he supplies that need. Look with me back at Luke 18. Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable, Jesus, of course, here, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. All right, so this widow lady has a need. The need is that she has an adversary who's giving her grief. I don't know what the context is. It's a parable. The Lord doesn't tell us. But clearly this thing was vitally important to her. It's a great need, causing her great grief. And so she goes to the judge, and she says, Avenge me of mine adversary. In verse 4, And he would not. For a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, I don't fear God, and I really don't care what people think. 
Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord is going to use this parable as an example of how we should pray. He says in verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. So he's not agreeing with what the judge is doing. He says the judge is unjust. But he's using the principle. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Your need may be tremendous. You may have talked to God about it many times. And the Lord says there are some people who cry day and night, and yet God still bears a long time with them. He still doesn't answer. He still tests our faith. He tests our perseverance. And in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. The Lord always comes through for the genuine needs in our lives if we'll be faithful and keep taking those to him. And the opposite at the end of the verse, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I don't know what your need is tonight, but if Jesus comes back next week, is he going to find you still faithfully trusting him for that need? Or will he find you giving up? Saying, oh, well, God didn't answer, so I'm just going to go ahead and give up on this thing. Go with me back to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a little bit embarrassed about your need. It's not something that you would publicly talk about. Maybe you're struggling with some sin in your life that you don't want anyone to know about. Maybe you're struggling with some issue that is just a real private thing that you don't want to share around. And you just feel a bit embarrassed to even talk to God about it. And some people don't get their needs met because they fail to ask because they're embarrassed. It's a pride thing. You know, it takes a humble person to ask for help. That's why guys always got lost before GPS came along. <laughs> they never wanted to admit they didn't know where they were going, did they? And finally their wives would get really frustrated and say, pull over and all sort of drama. But anyway, we won't go there tonight. Of course, I never did that. But anyway, <laughs> Isaiah chapter 7, look at verse 11. Isaiah 7, 11. <clears throat> Uh, look at verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. So God is telling the king, Ask thee for a sign. Ask thee for a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. That's full of pride. God said, Ask. He says, Oh, no, I don't want to impose upon God. I, I don't want to be, you know... He wouldn't humble himself. And he missed out on a blessing, and God gave him a sign anyway and judged him accordingly. Have you asked God? Have you talked to him about your need? Are you still talking to him about your need? Sometimes the problem is simply unbelief. Look over at John chapter 4. If I really believed that God could meet my need tonight, and I really wanted him to meet that need knew he could do it, I'd be a fool not to talk to him about it. If I knew that you had a million dollars and you wanted to give it away and I needed a million dollars and you stood up and said, hey, I've got a million dollars for anybody who'll come ask me for it, I'd be, I'd be crazy not to go ask you for it. But unbelief would probably keep me from doing it. And that's the problem. Many times we know these things, but we don't act upon them. We're showing that we don't believe. Here in John chapter 4, look down at verse 10. Jesus is speaking with a woman at the well here. He's uh, clearly taking the opportunity to share the truth about himself as the living water with her. And he says in John 4.10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Lady, you've got this tremendous need in your life. You're going to die and go to hell. And I am offering you living water. I'm offering you eternal life. And if you knew who I was, and you knew that I could do this, you'd be asking me and I'd be giving. But you're not asking because you don't believe this. Whatever that need is, do you really believe God can supply it? Don't hesitate. 
You know he can. He's made the promise. Talk to him about it. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. How often do we stop asking before God stops answering? I remember uh, talking to somebody in our church in Blenheim many years ago. And uh, they were having some financial problems. And I was showing them from the Bible that one of the great ways to deal with financial needs is to be generous. God has promised if you are generous, he would be generous with you. You're stingy with him, he'll be stingy with you. And so I challenge them to, to tithe and to give and to be generous. And I talked to him a few weeks later, and uh, I said, so how's it going? Oh, it's not going good at all. The need's greater than it's ever been. I said, well, did you do what I challenged you to do from the Bible? Oh, yeah, we tried that, and it didn't work. <laughs> and that's what we do. We give up on these things. Bible principles we should never give up on. So, we need to make sure we're faithful in church. We need to ask, is something else that we need to do if we're going to see our needs met. Look at Philippians 2, verse 1. Philippians 2, 1. The Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. You may know what consolation means? If you console somebody, yeah, if they're sad or you're encouraging or comforting or trying to help them out, trying to meet the need that they have. Well, if we're going to find consolation in Christ, if we're going to get the help from him that we need, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. So if we're going to find these things in our lives from Christ, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be through, done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. If you want some need met from Christ, then you need to step out and help somebody else. When you try to help meet the needs of others, the Lord says, oh, okay, now they're ready, and he steps in to help meet your needs. That's the simple principle here. Go over to Proverbs chapter 11. So often when we've got a need... We look at ourselves. We spend a lot of time in the mirror. Woe is me. I've got this problem. Oh, if only this would happen. If only that would happen. And we spend all the time looking inward when the first thing we should do is look outward. We reach out to others and be a blessing to others, and God will be a blessing to you. It's just a simple Bible principle. Jesus put it, and Paul recorded it in the book of Acts, it is more blessed to... Give than to receive. We know the principle, but are we putting it into effect? Who have you been a blessing to this week? Look at Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. Now this isn't rocket science we're dealing with here tonight. Just simple Bible principles. The ones that we so easily forget. Proverbs eleven twenty four. 11.24 There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. Now that doesn't make sense. That's a paradox. If I've got something and I scatter it around, I should have less of it. But the Bible says, Solomon, the smartest man who ever lived, says, There is that scattereth, and yet he increaseth. That's not the way it should work, but that's what he says will happen. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Again, this is counterintuitive. The guy who hangs on to more than his fair share should have more than everybody else. But that guy tends to poverty because there's a spiritual element to all this that you can't get away from. And the next verse says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. Now, it's not talking about politics. All right. If you're if you're labor, you're you're not going to be made fat in this passage. All right, fat in the in the sense of increased with blessings. It's talking about generosity. 
Um, liberals claim to be liberal or generous, but they're being generous with other people's money, which is the problem. We're supposed to be generous with our own, our own goods. And the one that is liberal is the one that's going to be blessed. When you are generous and spread things out, God will bring it back. This isn't prosperity theology. It's simply the Bible principle that God blesses when we put others ahead of ourselves. He doesn't want us putting ourselves first. 25, the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Go to Job 26. Job 26. Who have you been a blessing to this week? Who have you helped? I'm not saying necessarily write a check to. If you can still write checks. I don't think you can these days. But anyway, who have you been a blessing to? Who have you taken time, taken effort, and made the effort to be a blessing to? And I'm talking about every age. We need to be teaching our kids to put others ahead of self, to do something for the other siblings, and to get our eyes and focus off ourselves. The people sometimes who are the most needy find this the greatest challenge because our need just consumes us. But we need to be looking outward. Job 26. This is a great passage right here. And uh, we find Job telling a parable. And he's speaking or responding to Bildad here. And notice what he says to this fellow. But Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? He's basically asking this guy, how have you helped other people this week? How have you helped the guy that has no power? How have you saved the arm that had no strength? How have you counseled the guy who lacks wisdom? And those are some questions we should be asking ourselves. How have I been a help this past week to somebody? If we can't get a clear answer on that, maybe we've got a reason why our needs aren't being met quite like we'd like them to be. All right, we've got a few more verses when we'll be done here tonight. Run over with me to Psalm 119. The fourth way that the Lord is going to step in and help meet whatever your need is tonight is if you'll search the Scriptures. The Bible always has the right answer. This book is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Whatever your need is, there is a verse in the Bible about it somewhere. The chance that your, your uh, solution is in the Bible is not 20% or 50% or 90%, it's 100%. God has something to say about everything. And so he tells us, study to show ourselves approved unto God. He tells us, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. He's doing these things because he knows the answers are in there. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, we realize that. Do we really believe that there's a 100% chance that the Bible has something to say about our greatest need tonight? Be careful before you agree with that, because if it's really 100%, what are you doing to find the answer to that greatest need? All right, you've got some kind of need in mind tonight, some need in your life. Can you give me two promises from the Bible about your need? That's what we need to be doing, is searching the Scripture and looking for the promises of God. That's what we saw back there in Hebrews. Faithful is he that promised. Whatever your need is, dig into the Scriptures and find some promises from God about that and claim those things and hang on to them. Psalm 119, look down at verse 18. I love this verse right here. It's an awesome verse because it's something that we often fail to do and we wonder what the problem is. Psalm 119, 18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Before we open this book, we should be asking God that prayer right there. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see what it is that you have for me. The Bible's not merely some academic thing. It's supposed to be practical. And the point is for God to speak to us, to show us something from the Word. And it's all too easy for us to, to get into the word out of duty. Or I've got to read my three pages or my two chapters. Or I always read for 15 minutes at this time in the morning. 
And we forget these are God's living words. And he's trying to speak to our hearts. Last one, go over to Proverbs chapter 3. And this is kind of a summation of the four we've looked at so far. We've got needs in our lives, but well, we should be in church. And we should be focusing on being a blessing to others. We should be asking God. We definitely should be seeking to help others. We should be searching the scriptures. And if we could work all these together in a summation, it would be be faithful and trust God. Trust and obey. We need to have that balance. We need to work like it depends on us, but trust God like it depends on him. God expects us to be faithful. We should expect him to be faithful. If we do nothing but work, we're slighting God. We're not trusting him. You know, I'm going to hunt and search and trust and work. No, we need, to, uh, we need to get him to do his part. And if we do nothing but trust, we've ignored the commands where he's told us to get into the word and help others. So there's a balance in this thing. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3. You know the passage. This one right here isn't uh, new to any of us. But Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Three conditions that culminate in a promise. We're told, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And then you've got the promise. He shall direct thy paths. We need to be putting that effect in our lives. And so my challenge to you tonight is, are you doing what you can? Are you trusting God to do the part that you can't do? We can only control what we can control. The rest has to be up to him. Let's close by going over to Psalm 55 here tonight. Psalm 55. What is your greatest need? Psalm 55, verse 22. 55, 22. Cast thy burden. Burden is a need. A need that we can't do much about and that we uh, get weighed down by. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. The promise, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Tonight, you need to take that burden. You need to give it to the Lord. And you need to trust him to meet that thing. And then you need to follow through on these commands that we've been looking at tonight and put them into effect. And the next time somebody says, so what was your greatest need? You can say, well, I gave that need to the Lord, and, and these are the two promises I found out about it. And you're ready to deal with that thing and see God work in our lives. So many times we look at miracles out there, we say that they're big things that happen in other people's lives, but God wants to do some things in our lives if we'll simply trust him to meet our needs. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Can you trust him for that tonight? Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are our provider. We thank you that you're our sustainer. We thank you that you've given us these other believers among us tonight to help us. And I pray that we would be the blessing to one another that you've commanded us to be. And Lord, that you would help this church going forward to meet one another's needs and that you would step in and take care of those things that are beyond their ability to provide. And Lord, that each of us would find our strength in you from the little leaves to the teens, right up on to the older folks. Lord, that each one of us would see your working in our lives. And Lord, that we would in turn be able to stand and to declare to others what a great God you are and how you've taken care of us. Please, Lord, help us to just help us to make a difference in the lives of others and to keep the focus where it needs to be this week. So we ask for your help and strength in these things, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.